Hi, everyone. My name is Yang. Um, I'm here to, I think, share a part of my monkey brain with you. Um, I teach in a university, but there never is this kind of a podium, which is so much of a luxury and so sort of exposed. Um, so be it. And um, my presentation is going to be in three parts. Um, in the first part, I'm going to share with you a personal encounter. Um, which I think had helped me think through the issues of the international, if there's such a thing. Um, and then in the second part, I'm going to share with you some happenings, some events in Hong Kong in the past two, three years that I find very important. I call them emergent criticalities. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not confident yet that I can call them um, emergent culture in Raymond Williams' terms, um, but I think the idea of emergent and even his idea of pre-emergence is important because then we get to pay our attention to what's happening and what's in the formulation. And then in the third part, I'll talk um, briefly about my work um, independently and also with Sound Pocket, um, and end with a certain ethics of listening, which is not anything new. There are a lot of scholars who've been talking about ethics of listening, but I think um, at this juncture of time, um, the here and now, and the always already beyond the here and now, it would be good to remind ourselves of this ethics. Except for Clive Owen's Hollywood International, in which art is very much in the background or in the foreground, wherever you like to stand in relation to it, the international does not have a face. But is it inevitably an, an adjective? I, I had this thought um, of the international being an adjective or the woundedness of an adjective from um, Holland Bach, um, the, the older, the earlier Bach, who um, talked about in the essay, The Grain of the Voice, the adjective being sometimes wounded, sometimes pleased, but always constituted. I'm not a theorist, but I like words very much because they give shape to ideas. They are physical to me. So I would like to consider his idea of the adjective as being constituted. Um, this will be sort of the backdrop and maybe the background noise of my presentation. The encounter I want to share with you is um, about a retiring international Biennale curator. A few years ago, he was in Hong Kong and we were in a very noisy restaurant and he was trying to tell me um, how he started to get bored with listening or with hearing a lot of names that got repeated and repeated in the places he went to to curate. Um, I think he was in a moment of despair. Um, uh, 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 um, I, I imaginatively, hypothetically, the local hero might come up and say, here you are, this is the flying curator who misses the point about anything happening on the ground, and so you deserve this despair, this moment of despair. And then perhaps a global hero would also pop up and say, well, this is part of being professional. You have to be able to sort of survive boredom and feel refreshed. Um, to be able to uh, take in so much art uh, when you really cannot and still be able to come back to your practice. I think this kind of um, heroism uh, is unnecessary and not helpful in our understanding um, today of what's happening in the arts. And I think we don't need another hero, uh, so, I'm going to move away from that as quickly as possible and into, back into my position as his friend. As a friend, I think what he's telling me is rather this, that he is worldly, he is a worldly kind of person. He's very much involved in worldly affairs, affairs that he doesn't have full control of. And he is always under pressure to respond and sometimes 
vulnerable. I think Ruth mentioned vulnerability. Um, sometimes feeling uh, vulnerable precisely because he is very sensitive to what's happening around him. And I think he's also telling me that he's emotionally needy. He could be bored, he could get bored, and boredom is with him, and he could be caught in moments of inertia, um, which is a moment of no ending in sight. When is this going to end? When can I stop working and go on a holiday? This might be what we, some of us have in mind now. And then he was also telling me, I think, as a friend, that he is intellectually needy. I think he needs um, intellectual stimulation um, as much as he is self-sufficient, probably, as a professional. Um, he also wants to acknowledge, embrace, and embrace deeply, not just in the service, but embrace deeply influences from cultural others, whoever they are, whoever who he comes into encounter with. So this self-sufficiency, I would say, is not an isolation, it's not a form of isolation, but rather a way of performing his function well by independent reasoning and also by being active among others. This is in the Aristotelian sense. I think it requires a lot of intellectual discipline on his part and anyone who is in his situation to not fret about the disappearance or absence of the ethnographic other while acknowledging that other as a source of influence, embracing it as a source of influence. In all, I think what he's asking for me as a friend is that uh, I should regard him as someone with a face, a real face, not an international face, because there's no such thing. A face that is telling, telling of his emotions, of his state of mind, uh, a face that doesn't substitute for a thing. Um, and this is therefore the first point I want to make. I want to be able to find ways to address the international so that it is not a brand or a signature, but a human face. To call this a human phase is not to say that I'm embarking on any humanitarian project or any human-centered way of thinking. I am very, I, I have problems with uh, a human-centered way of thinking. I think human beings are responsible for the poetry of other beings. And in Robert Bringhurst's terms, um, poetry does not belong to human beings alone, but to trees and air and mountains and the sea. Um, my point in this part of the presentation is, how could we make the conditions for responsible or ethical practices that acknowledge each other? Or the translation could be, how could we have dinner together by fully embracing the pressure of time and money and the noise all around? Now, the second part of my presentation which has to do with the question of why here, why now? In a significant moment in the study of contemporary culture, Homi Baba coins the, the idea of um, new internationalism. He says, trans, um, he, he interprets new internationalism in this way, transnational and translational sense of the hybridity of imagined communities. This is in the location of culture, to mark what he called new in the internationalism. This is, he says, the enjoining of the historical memory of post-colonial communities to an emergent public sphere as an international intellectual community. I think his new international could be one part of this conference's title, but not all. I think he's interested in the specific and ongoing translation of how decolonized peoples live and involve themselves in transcultural ways of thinking. By transcultural, I mean the production of the cultural or culture as a result of pressures from the national and, in, and the international, depending on the situation. Taking the view from Hong Kong, I want to ask what this enjoining entails. How are such processes of enjoining constituted, determined, and experienced socially? The way limits are set, pressures are exerted. This is also in Raymond Williams' study of emergent culture and small cultural groups in his um, Culture and Materialism and Marxism and Literature. This is my classic. It's a little bit old school, but I'm going to keep talking about him. 
Each post-coloniality, I think, considering the tendency as alive in many parts of the world, is specific and different. In Hong Kong, it's been 16 years since our return to the sovereignty of China. Much attention has been given on the discussion of identity, on its construction, and the post-coloniality of this identity. I think the area of culture and identity politics is important but not adequate in addressing the changes taking place in the way art is made in Hong Kong, made in and made by Hong Kong, in the site and also by artists who are based here, who are not necessarily ethnically Chinese or Hong Kong in any way, especially considering the many forms of criticalities I find emerging. So I'm going to run through a few incidents um, that I think sh can sharpen our sensitivities towards the grain taking shape. I, as I said in the beginning, I'm not confident enough yet um, to call, this, um, call these incidents emergent culture, but I think the idea of emergent and emergent criticality, which is more my term, um, um, is important and helpful in addressing all the complexities and meanings of what we are doing. Postcoloniality tends to be discussed, as I said, as a kind of uh, uh, as relating to the area of self-representation. And I would like to coin um, Ray Chow in his essay between colonizers, Hong Kong's postcolonial self-writing in the 1990s. It was published in 1998, and I quote at length. She says, "Hong Kong's postcoloniality is marked by a double impossibility." It will be as impossible to submit to China uh, Chinese nationalist nativist repossession as it has been impossible to submit to British colonialism. As such, Hong Kong's postcolonial reality expunges all illusions of the possibility of claiming a native culture. Illusions that have remained the strongest grounds for anti-colonial resistance among previously colonized countries around the world. Instead, Hong Kong confronts us with a question that is yet unheard of in colonial history. How do we talk about a coast coloniality that is a forced return without the consent of the colony's residents to a mother country, itself as imperialistic as the previous colonizer? Is Hong Kong then simply an anomaly in the history of colonialism? Or does it not, in its obligatory restoration to China, in fact crystallize and highlight the problem of origins that has often been suppressed in other postcolonial cultures because of ethnic pride? End quote. If there is no native to be found, how then is one to make sense of who the Hong Kong self, if there's such a thing, is without going to any idea or notion of an essentialist local, which doesn't help this um, con um, the, the contention, uh, and at least is it possible to distinguish the national from its resistance? I think it is possible for us to distinguish at least without going for the local essentialist or the essentialist local, um, to identify the national and the resistant national in order that we could know who is collaborating with who, or which system is collaborating with which other system. In more recent Hong Kong, a rhetoric from Beijing has emerged that sets out limits in an existing rhetoric of Hong Kong government city branding strategies calling Hong Kong an international city. This is in the context of Hong Kong's, um, uh, a lot of Hong Kong people's call for universal suffrage, so democracy. For Beijing, this international, this Hong Kong being an international city, is regulated. In public discussions about implementing universal suffrage in Hong Kong, Beijing refers to domestic conditions, conditions that are often unspecified but coined as reasons, a convenient reason perhaps, for the irrelevance of such international mandates as International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that protects rights of self-determination. So within the overriding and gigantic, I use Susan Stewart's term, national narrative, Hong Kong can be international in so far as it re remains regulated by the nation. It is a convenient um, sort of label, but it's also very concrete 
and material, and it exerts real control over the public domain, over the rhetoric. Rhetorics, I think, are important because they participate, they constitute the public domain. In this slide, any claim that Hong Kong is international by being a haven for political dissent, including that of artists from China in the form of art in, say, the Sikh collection acquired by M+, as an articulation of an, is an articulate excuse me, of the national project, not, as in its website says, a collection that looks at the world from a Hong Kong perspective. This regulated and repeated production of the meaning of the international as permitted dissent within national boundary is one-sidedly China's self-representation, not Hong Kong's. It misses much more complex ways in which the international manifests itself in Hong Kong, including the way it produces post-colonial self-representations. The international as an adjective that pleases China is the international national or national international, one that is also wounded by being an anomaly seen from the critical international and the uh, translocal international. This is my translation of Homi Baba's idea of um, an perhaps imaginary and also hypothetical even international intellectual community. I would rather use the idea of the critical, international, and translocal. My question then is, is it possible that a Hong Kong perspective delinked from the national can emerge? For instance, how does the museum as a public organization or institution intend to understand and put into place the understanding, the ways of understandings, and produce a Hong Kong perspective? I think this could be kept an open question here. I think we should not be rushed by time to come to any hurried conclusion but it must be kept as an open question. This must be a commitment. And what kind of commitment is it? I would say it is a moral commitment. It's a moral undertaking because the public is very much in this um, contention. I think it is important, therefore, to consider the international as in a moment of production. It's important that we identify the pressures that exert upon the definition of the international and how, in a consequential way, the local or the national or other, or other terms that feel um, the competitive force of the international, all these other terms, I think it's important that we commit to identifying what exactly we are talking about. I'm not sure if I can do that myself, but I hope this would be a chance for us to listen to each other um, in that direction. Now, as I promised, um, I am going to share with you a few happenings and incidents in Hong Kong um, in the past two, three years. Um, that are emergent in the sense that new meanings and values, new practices, new relationships and kinds of relationships are continually being created. This is a process and this is a process of change and um, I am doing this, running through all these incidents simply because I think it would sharpen our sensitivity to the here and now. Raymond Williams admits when he talks about this idea of the emergent that it's very difficult to study or put um, into analysis um, small cultural groups. It, within the group, people tend to call themselves, we are just friends, we are not a group. And there tends to be no manifesto, and there tends to be no sort of declaration. But he says it's possible for us to identify some ethos, distinguishable ethos, he says. And I'm going to try to do that in each case, or in all the case as a whole. The first incident I'd like to share with you is the formation of the group Art Citizens. It was in response to the forced disappearance of Ai Weiwei in 2011. Um, the name Art Citizens didn't come by easily. It took maybe two long meetings for people who came into this place, which is Wolfa Tang in uh, Yao Mate, which is an art space, artist-run space as well, 
um, it took many hours for people to eventually um, come down to this name. Um, the art citizens, I think, is uh, I, I, I heard a, a few um, mentionings of the idea of solidarity. I would use that term. I would say that it is a matter of solidarity when art citizens was formed, but it is not a solidarity that stops at um, that moment of coming together. I think it is a solidarity that is distributed and allows itself to be distributed in sort of other aspects of um, art and culture throughout these three few years. And I think it is because of the dissipation of the solidarity that is important, that makes it important. Um, the Art Citizens Group has no sort of fixed membership and there is no sort of instituting act that put this organization into place. And the members, so-called, the people who come into the meeting every time uh, was different. And then there would be um, organizations that um, extend their arms to artists, inviting artists to create um, for um, values, values that we support, values of um, um, self-determination, values of autonomy to uh, our own life, and values of freedom of speech. And the artists, art citizens organized a march on April 23rd, this is, um, and a lot of artists and activists and poets, um, cross-disciplinary artists joined. And again, there were no manifesto, but I think it's possible to talk about the distinguishable ethos as perhaps in a list, um, following list. Um, trust, I think, has been really important, and open mind, Care, care for your not having slept enough and not having eaten well. Um, honesty about who and what organizations are contributing money. Intimacy in terms of close um, intimate relationships. Freedom. And I think the last point um, for me is personally uh, particularly important, um, interdependence. I, I, I think it is um, important at this moment, um, the here and now, to stress the importance of dependence, the kind of dependence that is not about one um, having one leader or one individual who knows all or who um, would direct the group, but mutual independence, interdependence. Um, the way it works in the Art Citizens Group is really that when meetings were held, um, the role of who would lead the meeting, who would throw points out or issues out to be discussed would be sort of muddled between all. Um, sometimes it's you, sometimes it's me, sometimes it's other people. So the way of being flexibly organized rather than formally organized, um, organize the group. And then the art citizens, Casey Wong uh, was very much um, part of the art citizens, but sometimes not as well. He, um, this is him in 2012, um, July 1st, March. For those of us who may not know the July 1st um, background, just briefly, in 2003, um, the government uh, proposed to pass a law in Hong Kong which would limit um, uh, civil freedom, civil rights, and would increase substantially police power um, or police presence to daily life um, of um, citizens of Hong Kong. And some uh, 500,000 people went out on the streets. And since 2003, every year, July 1st, which is also the day when Hong Kong returned to Chinese sovereignty, um, a celebration on the part of China, but resistance and dissent on the part of Hong Kong. Um, every July 1st, then, there would be all these marches. Casey Wong played the True Culture Bureau, secretary or minister of the True Culture Bureau. And this has the background of another um, group that was uh, formed in, in line with, I would say, the um, art citizens. And this group um, has core members. And one of the members is an organization, Factory Concern Group, which had done a lot of work in um, negotiating with the government um, how best to zone or not zone, refuse the zoning of um, lofts and factory units in Hong Kong. 
This is interesting um, for me, for this purpose here, because of the second point. When they argue for the candidacy for the Secretary of Culture, which then never actually took place, the government sort of put the proposal aside. It was originally a proposal for the government to restructure itself, reorganize the departments and bureaus, and then to put in place such a thing as the um, Culture Bureau, and the Secretary of Culture will then head the bureau. Um, this group, um, consisting of all these members and many other people who joined and um, who came in and out, um, laid down a few qualities that they think are essential to any candidate to be the cultural secretary. And one of them caught sort of my attention, which is the second one. He has a professional background in culture. This is actually very vague. What does it mean to have a professional background in culture? Because we all live in culture already, and we are all experts of our culture in a way, in a certain level of things. So what does it mean to say that um, this secretary should have a background in uh, culture, professional background in culture? Um, it was a moment, I think, when the professional was produced as a strategy because of the kind of pressure that um, the government is exerting on to um, practitioners, art and cultural practitioners. Um, the, the, the kind of pressure that someone who is, there was a candidate who um, talked about herself as being a CEO, as um, being able and capable to act as Secretary of Culture, um, just as she is a Chief Executive Officer of any transnational company, as long as she can move between um, the different companies, there would be the same kinds of routines that she would go through, she would be able to manage as well as Secretary of Culture. And it is this kind of um, narrative or discourse that I think had put pressure on the groups, um, the art and uh, culture practitioners to claim um, a professional, maybe reluctantly, but to claim that it is possible we talk about ourselves, represent ourselves as being professionals or being professional. And that would mean an identification with our peers. That would be the one, I think, most important uh, value among others. The claim that there are peers, the recognition of peers in the community, there are people who do the same thing, who care for the good of the art, whatever that means, um, the bad side as well. Um, by good, I don't mean to moralize art, and we could always be on the wrong side of politics. Um, the identification with that, and also the disidentification, so that making art perhaps unprofessionally um, could also be seen as professional. I, I, would, I, I already said that I am going to call, I would like to call these moments of unity and solidarity. And they are moments that are fragile, um, but I think they enable a lot of us to contextualize what we have been doing in different ways. Um, I think also that um, if we s start seeing practices um, today perhaps the practices to come um, in the light of um, this, these moments of coming together, it would be possible to imagine that these kinds of solidarity, dissipated solidarity, uh, have consequences on how um, artists work. Besides um, groups, um, there are also individual artists who pick on the mission, who pick on um, what um, he could do as a citizen um, relative to the institutions, relative to the gigantic. This is artist Luke Cheng, and the background of this quote, this is from his personal blog, the background of this quote is this. Um, last year, in June, um, the Arts Development Council in Hong Kong announced um, its collaboration with M Plus as curator for the Venus Biennale that is going to open very soon in June. Um, myself and a number of um, practitioners organized a public campaign to call for the explanation of the decision how it came about, and also we organized a campaign to call for the transparency of public institutions in making this kind of decisions. 
Um, there were contentions as to whether M plus should be the curator, whether it would bring good to Hong Kong's art development or not. I'm not going to into the details today here, but I want to make this point about this debate or this incident that I think is continuing, the discussion is continuing. This incident as being important because this is a rare ideological debate that is taking place in Hong Kong. Um, there had been a long time where discussions about art and culture is focused on identity issues and resource allocation issues. This time, we are looking at ideological issues. What is the public? What makes it public? What gives right to the public to claim that it is indeed the public? So the ideology or the contest of ideology is very much about legitimacy of rights and duties of public institutions. This is caught in processes of professionalization, of course, because we are seeing in Hong Kong institutions of professionalization um, 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 setting up. And I would want to propose at this point without much research to propose or to speculate, actually, that um, the idea of right um, of these institutions, these public, in public institutions, again, has to be kept open. I think the institutions um, draw their legitimacy from multiple powers and not just authority of one particular profession. I think it's important to distinguish between legitimacy and authority. I quote Luis uh, Menand, who studied um, professional organizations, professional associations in the 19th century and early 20th century. Um, he was talking more about literary organization and academic uh, professional associations, but I think his, um, his insight is helpful. He says, professionalization results in redistribution of social values. The autonomous individual is now figured as less free than the person who operates as the extension of an organization. Less free because less secure in his sense of, identify, of identity. Less likely to get done what he wants done. Less able to hold his course in the winds of competing interests. The tendency of every organization, he says, is self-limiting. And this means that the tighter the individual identifies with the group, the more sharply defined and effective will be the authority he derives from it. He talks about authority and the formation of authority and the formation of claims to authority by implication. I would still insist that it's important to distinguish between authority and legitimacy in a civil society and in terms of public institutions and how they operate. I think that the, the redistribution, this is a point of perhaps disagreement or distance from Menant, uh, is that I think that redistribution of values does not have to mean homogenization. Uh, it does not have to mean the, the, the mono tonalization of a, a certain way of talking about the professional. I see precisely, for instance, the art citizens, for instance, this group that refuses um, or keeps a critical distance from what it means to be professional. There is the claim, the strategic claim, when, it, when it's needed, and there is the critical need to refuse when uh, it comes to um, talk or discussion about values. The um, Luke here says, Mr. Needway, um, I started with him, and I'm going to end this part of my presentation with him. Um, Luke says, Mr. Needway, you said that your team could support you and complement your knowledge on local art. This is when he presented on uh, or res responded to um, the protest against the collaboration between ADC and M+. What I can see instead is the conceptual museum lacking strategy, vision, and commitment. Yong Ping is the CEO of the Arts Development Council, and he calls him by first name, as if a friend. Is this a constructive opinion? Luke uh, has been uh, 
sort of posing himself or aligning himself, engaging himself with institutions. Um, there is a history to Luke's practice of engaging himself, this lone body with um, the institutions and power and state apparatuses. And this is from 2007, um, the show that I curated sort of um, because it was also a movement that uh, many artists just voluntarily came together because um, there were complaints about the um, goods of desire, that furniture shop, um, uh, 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 making t-shirts with the triad name 14K on, on it. And there were groups that complained about it. Police went to GOD and arrested um, almost 20 designers, including um, the owner, Douglas Young. And a lot of artists saw that as an incident of infringement of creative freedom and felt the need to come out. And this is the work by Luke Cheng in that show. I don't think I have time to go through all these, but this is another sort of fragment that I would like to bring in, the way of sort of non-human-centered thinking. This is the project by Video Touch, the longest, um, sort of oldest um, a media organization in Hong Kong, an artist-run space. Um, a recent project they have been doing is um, Wikitopia. Um, 2013. And I want to coin this not because I want to prove that this is an international project, although it's very internationalist in outlook. I want to coin this because I find the post-human way of thinking, the materialization of data, the insistence that we refuse to self-write as if we were human, but rather that we insist we are always already electronically prosthetic and prosthetic all the way. Um, this insistence, this posthuman self, I find very um, helpful um, when we want to think in terms of the possibility of any global society or global civil society. I won't go into that. Instead, I'd like to recall a laugh from Leung Ping Kwan Yasi, who uh, passed away some months ago. Um, a project, a book project, and a storytelling project by MCCM Creations, which is a small publisher in Hong Kong. The book uh, published after 18 months of telling stories about Hong Kong and about many other things, the supernatural, as I think David mentioned, and many other natural and not natural, um, coming into um, um, sort of materialization as the book called Our Legend, uh, Our, Our City, Our Legends 103. In this book, in the preface, Yasi, the poet, um, writes um, in response to so, sort of a criticism, a criticism that these stories were told in the Hong Kong Art Center, which has been labeled middle class and not grassroots enough, and that this criticism comes from um, someone, an anonymous someone, who Yasi quoted, um, saying that places like Shakit May, for instance, the JCCAC Art Center in Shakit May, which is a sort of reformed sort of factory building, that would be more authentic kind of storytelling. Yasi responded in his preface with a laugh, and this, uh, these two lines from a poet he admires himself. Don't need much light for stories in the night. OK. Now, listening. Somewhere, somehow, we are always eating. And it helps um, to sort of gather energy. Um, I would. I would talk a little bit about how Sound Pocket works. Sound Pocket, I founded in 2008. Um, we do curated programs, and by that we mean we are socially motivated. We want to bring people together. Our projects bring people together. So they are very much socially motivated, but it is not social activism that we are doing. We are also very socially active. We are always somewhere together doing something. 
taking a walk in the park, eating or listening or um, checking some things out and going to like Apple Guy to get electronics or stuff. Um, what I mean, uh, we, 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 we materialize this kind of social motivation by counterparting the artists who come in with artists who are practicing here or art students who are, are here. Um, one example, we have been doing this since our festival around Sound Art Festival in 2009, and um, now this year we have just completed our third edition of the festival. By counterparting, I mean, for instance, in 2009, um, artists from China Yan Jun came and he stayed on um, Lama Island and we counterparted him with local artist um, Edwin Lowe, who is also uh, uh, an artist working with sound. And in 2010, Ralph Julius came from uh, Berlin and um, with Mickey Yui, um, who is based in Dusseldorf, uh, um, but originally from Japan. And we counterparted them with two young artists, um, Fritz Chang, uh, Xin Yu, and um, also, um, uh, um, uh, um, help us who are art students who in the Baptist University, the Academy of um, Visual Art. Um, there are many other names that I cannot list here, but um, I th uh, what we are doing there is that we have a certain faith in the expression of emotions as telling of ethical significance. This is Martha Nussbaum's idea that emotions are not barriers to our reasoning, but rather indicators of ethnic, ethical undertaking. We, we, we want to do this strategy of counterparting because we believe um, that uh, it is important that we generate new relationships between real people. And to do so, we need to keep ourselves small, and we also need to keep some numbers sort of going and intact. Um, I won't go over the three sort of inspirations. This is sort of post. This is sort of cheating because they didn't inspire me before I did the festival, but because of this conference, I went looking for ways to theorize or describe um, how we work. And um, there, I found uh, three that I really admire, that I emulate. I won't go into them, but um, I will come back to Kanta's notion of the third year when I conclude the presentation. But I just want to say that from Sound Pocket's point of view, um, we work in terms of three layers of audiences. The first audience would be um, artists who may not be very committed yet if they want to be artists or not. And this is the incubation period, and we find that very important because there are a lot of artists who, become, who come under pressure after graduation to find a good job and a normal job, to be normal rather than happy. So we want, we think they should be supported. Um, and then the second layer of audience are the concerned outsiders who uh, may or may not know art, may or may not have been to exhibitions, but they are curious. They are concerned. They think there is a part they can play in terms of coming to meet us. And then the third, at the last, um, the, the, less, the least important, at least for now, for Sound Pocket, a small organization, is the general public. Um, I, I want to bring in here um, a, a, a way of talking about um, um, uh, how we work, <clears throat> which seems not to be related to the audience, but it's very much related to what I mean by we want to generate relationships, generate social relationships. And these relationships are not just for pleasure or utility, the, 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 the utility of you know, meeting the deadline, but the um, but the very sort of um, relationship in terms of reasoning to each other, in terms of creating space for falsehood, for the imperative to, to, to falsify something, or the need to falsify something when something is really false, um, to be able to deal with truth together. And I... Uh, and I bring in um, Rabino, who um, quotes um, Ian Hacking's idea of reasoning as opposed to the idea of logic. Um, he says, uh, 
I think, okay, that's fine. He says, by reasoning, I don't mean logic. I mean the every um, opposite for logic, um, the, I, the, the very opposite, I'm sorry about the typo. I mean the very opposite, for logic is the preservation of truth, while a style of reasoning is what brings in the possibility of truth or falsehood. The styles of reasoning create the possibility of truth and falsehood, deduction and induction merely preserve it. I think this is a way, at least for me, what I've learned from this is that um, when people come together, we come together for, uh, with an eye on the good of art, which is not to say that art, I repeat, is morally good all the time. It is just to say as much as we eat fruit and apples because we think they are good for our health, which doesn't promise or guarantee anything, but still we believe in that good. And I sound precisely like an adult idealist, but I am. And this, I learned from this as well um, in terms of this, if I translate this, if someone then tells me, I hold the truth, I know the truth, the truth matters to you as much as it is to me, then the next question I would ask is that whether his idea of truth also admits possibilities of falsification, possibilities of falsehood, whether it is possible for me to argue against him as holder of truth. To be able to do that, to, to, to be able to safeguard that, I, th I will bring in then, by way of conclusion, the ethics of listening. To be able to safeguard that is not just um, a matter of exercising our reasoning, but a matter of listening first, listening to each other first. Listening is not a passive kind of activity. It is a productive kind of activity. It creates an interspace. Um, this interspace is precious but fragile. This interspace, um, hold on, Bath again says, um, is a space that presents a risk. It is always in this interspace that historical origins are not the most important thing, but the origin that is constituted in the texture of the voice and the body and speech sounded out by that body. So it is the grain and the materiality in that interspace of listening that matter before we define or um, confine, define as confining our notions of subjectivities under shelters of objectivity. So it is by accepting the risk that listening begins and is constituted. To return to the here and now, I think I have used up all the time, um, to speak then is not just to tell meanings in the language, but to listen to the sound, speech, and voice as objects of desire that are multiply and simultaneously originated and are upheld as, cons as a constitution of risk before and free of blame so that it is prevented from being wounded from being confined by the adjective. Thank you. Hi, so um, we're just going to have very brief questions. Any questions from the floor? Um, if, if you're positioning sort of the permitted descent in Hong Kong, uh, your example was the M plus collection, inclusion of Ai Weiwei and all that, um, as part of China's uh, presentation of itself for an uh, international uh, view. How do you differentiate uh, your own social activity, these emergent cultures that you're noting, uh, from that? What's the substantive difference uh, that puts you outside of that permitted space? Mm. I was just thinking about this just now. Um, first of all, I, the point I made about China is not China presenting itself in the international stage, but China self-representing. So my, the point I made was that um, 
any discourse, not China itself, but any narrative or ways of talking about um, Hong Kong being a place, a haven for dissident voices is from a China's from, is from China's perspective. It is China's way, it aligns with China's way of self-representing um, itself. Um, how do I distinguish between the two? I don't know, actually. But I think in the very sort of, uh, the, the, the very micro sense, in the micro relationships, um, as long as we, are together in terms of the ethos of being honest about what sort of alignments we put ourselves into, um, there will be a possibility for the distinction. I don't think this distinction could be made beforehand, though. I'm not trying to avoid the question, but I truly believe that it is not possible and not helpful, maybe, to think in terms of how we could set out a set of criteria to distinguish between what is what beforehand in terms of practice. Yeah, I, I, I'm very interested. It's, it's maybe a comment that could go on or, or could solicit um, hopefully um, more from you, but I'm very interested in, in your um, uh, referring to the ethics of listening, um, and and it brings up a lot of associations of how that works with some of the um, the the spaces of activism that you're talking about, how an ethics of listening um, functions in an activist context, mm -hmm. but um, but I'm maybe specifically interested right now just in hearing a little bit more about this rabbit project oh. and how that relates um, to the ethics of listening. So sure. I'd love if you can talk a little bit about that. Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, this is Edwin Lowe, and Edwin is almost 30, and he's a little bit worried about that. I'm sure he wouldn't mind that I say this. Um, he's a little bit worried be precisely because he's very committed to being an artist of uh, working with sound. And um, this is a project um, in, uh, he worked in collaboration with independent um, filmmaker Rita Hoyt. And um, there are many parts to this project. He made a performance, sound purely, in um, a, a four-channel kind of installation. And he used a lot of sound that he collected from protests, um, uh, anti-high-speed train protest, um, July 1st March protest. And then there was a part that is a video installation, which um, these are screen captures from his videos. And he would put these videos in very small um, sort of players. And he one version of this um, was um, presented in the um, Elements Mall um, outside of the cinema. And what he did was he pretended he was a rabbit. And of course, it wasn't very convincing. Uh, I mean, well, but then he put up some very long ears that are not supposed to be hearing. And um, what interests me about um, inserting a pair of long ears in these um, changing urban spaces um, one of them is this. Um, th this is no longer. This is in Wang Chok Hang, and um, this is where he went to school. And it is now demolished because of the train, um, um, the construction of the train uh, network. And I find um, his work interesting um, in terms of the ethics of listening because um, of the way he conjures up the possibility of um, this contact between human and human, human to space, human and space, and also presenting the idea of the emergent as, as being always imminent, immediate, but also sort of in, in a state of emergency, that it's fragile, it could suddenly just change, turn into something else, and um, fragile because it is um, up to or it confronts uh, a lot of competing forces in the same space. So in a way, his rabbit ears fictionalizes a site. And he, in his fictionalization, he is able to um, suggest to us that there are other ways of thinking about how we involve ourselves in the site, the people, and the activities there. Um, which is why I included um, Renee's idea of, of the fictional site, which I didn't have time to talk about. But um, 
his, his, uh, her idea that um, um, the fictional site actually enables um, not just associative um, links, but a process that allow other kinds of knowledge to emerge. And this is um, also, I think, associated with the idea of um, truth and falsehood, the idea, Hacking's idea of um, safeguarding a certain interspace of listening where there could be possibility of falsification and possibility of, I I guess in a naive way, but important way, imagination. Thank you for the question. One last question at the back. Hi, hi, Irina. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, uh, a slight, a short comment, and then a kind of provocation or a question that comes from this brainstorming of sorts. Um, you've chosen some kind of moments of rupture in terms of these art activism, such as the 2003 and the seven well, July 1st um, rallies and marches and all that. And uh, then contrasting this with um, the practice of Sound Pocket, as well mm. as a lot of other local initiatives um, that may or may not categorize themselves as artists' initiatives, such as uh, there are a lot of local research groups or um, there's this public space initiative um, started by a bunch of young professionals who actually, some of them work in the government or housing authority, and as well as uh, the urban laboratory that's actually also part of CUHK. And these are also kind of recent initiatives that are doing research work in terms of kind of the ethical practices uh, when it comes to space and resource allocation kind of thing. So, my, my question is what would be, um, how would you kind of also kind of read it as a continuation of Robin's um, question is, what is your reading on this kind of parallel circuits of, um, you can say ethical practices and how do you place the practice of sound pocket in the kind of grander narratives of, that are punctured by these moments of ruptures in, by July 1st or by 2003? and maybe in the upcoming you know, next election in 2017? I, 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 I will put aside sound pocket first. Um, I think I'd like to come back to the idea of interdependence. The idea that um, I don't know whether this is too, anyway, I'll make that claim. I think um, we are seeing people seeing beyond themselves. And I think in a way this is very basic, but also much forgotten in an everyday kind of routine way, much forgotten. And I don't know in an intimate and, and sort of academic kind of way, the groups that you mentioned. Um, I don't have personal experiences of many of them, but I, f I f think there has been some energy going on which has to do with the way that people want to be dependent and acknowledge and embrace influences from each other rather than to um, keep going with the individualistic kind of um, modernist project. Um, I don't know how Sound Pocket comes in. I was just talking to a friend, maybe she's gone now, about the next project that we'd like to do very much, maybe in five years, is to have everybody dancing on the streets. And this is not like the flash mob moment, but really dancing on the streets. This is old school, but I think there are commonalities between the way people get together. Thank you. Thank you all, um, and thank you, Yun Young, for the thank presentation. You. So we'll now move on to our last presentation, which Cosman will introduce.